All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Thoughtful Entrepreneur. I am your host, Jen Amos, and I'm just going to jump into it. I am really excited to introduce my guest to you today. We have Austin Church, who is the founder and brand consultant of Balernum. Austin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Jen. It's a delight to be here. Yes, uh, we were just talking offline about the difference between the generations, specifically Generation X and Millennials. And uh, I know as, as a Millennial, I'm a Millennial, my husband's a Generation X, and we were talking a little bit about you and your wife as well, and, and kind of the differences when it comes to uh, consuming social media and technology nowadays. It is an ongoing source of humor between <laughs> the two of us, because I have a background in English literature, uh -huh. And so I'm worthless at a trivia <laughs> night with anything involving pop culture. I can tell you about Beowulf. I can tell you about Shakespeare, iambic pentameter, um, the Iliad, the Odyssey, uh -huh. but I cannot use Snapchat. <laughs> I am more or less worthless on Instagram. I'm 38, so it's not even like I'm that old, but it seems like my brain was wired a certain way. I, I told you I feel like a feathered dinosaur yeah, where yeah. I have a foot in both worlds. I'm prehistoric, but I also have just a little bit of agility yeah. in the world. So yes, I can relate to you and your husband for sure. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about uh, just how my husband is constantly, constantly uh, educating him and himself on the social media world and online marketing. And it, it's like, he's so fascinated by it. And he's been in the, in, you know, he's been online for a long time for his business, but it, it just always seems like he it's like what comes naturally to me, he always feels like he has to educate. And, and I mean, I, I have to give it to him. There definitely, I didn't say this offline, but there are some things that he knows better than me. And I'm just like, oh, like I didn't know that, you know? So mm. I have to give him credit for, even though it's what comes natural to me, like hard work does pay off <laughs> and really self-educating on these things actually does pay off. Yeah, it totally does. And I think there's a lesson there about recognizing a gap recognizing that you're not where you want to be in a certain area and not mm -hmm. disqualifying yourself if you feel like you lack the natural aptitude or ability, but instead saying, well, if it's important, I'm going to commit to going to learn it. And I know I learned something. I come back to my wife, Megan, and I'm like, hey, and it's like, I'm a kid with a new toy. And she's like, oh, that's nice, honey. That, that's cute. Because it's something that she knew without knowing exactly that exactly. she knew it whereas for me it was like this this like shiny piece of hard-won wisdom <laughs> but so much of especially the last 10 years has been an ongoing commitment for me mm -hmm. to learning the things that are important to learn mm -hmm. whether or not they come naturally to me now I still try to play to my strengths mm -hmm. but a poet is not a natural businessman, right? It's right, not that right, some right, people right. wake up and they're these, um, these immediate entrepreneurs, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I just have to credit your husband for saying, if I need to fill in the gaps, if I need to shore up some area, if I need more scaffolding, then I'm going to go out and get it. And there's so much agency and there's so much optimism and hope in that yeah. versus, well, if I'm not good at this, I, this one thing, I guess I'm not cut out for business or I guess I just need to step out of the game. Yeah, absolutely. Like even though he could, let's say, feel like a dinosaur, he chooses not to. <laughs> right. Grow more feathers. Like there you go. <laughs> evolve, right. There you go. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Well, um, Austin, let's go ahead and we we talk, we chatted a little bit about yourself already. So let's talk about Balern. Uh, let's talk about Balernum. And I know that you are the founder and the brand consultant. For people that are hearing about it for the first time, tell us a little bit about what you do with Balernum. So we make building a real brand easier for online creators and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. The whole domain or subject of branding has evolved a lot over the last 50 years. And I think it can be very confusing and nebulous. Mm -hmm. We all have brands that we love and we love them for specific reasons. You could say, oh, I love Lululemon or I love Patagonia or I love Yeti or I love 
this, I love sweet greens, or there are so many amazing brands now, but when it comes to building your own, mm-hmm. well, how do you go about doing that? Like what is the nuts and bolts process for taking a passion that is burning into your, in, in your heart, taking right. some problem that you want to solve, taking something you believe in or stand for, and then banging that drum in such a way that other people want to join up with you. And so we have a really cool process. I think it's a lot of fun. I do think we make branding fun instead of frustrating or confusing. (laughs) And we come alongside founders, come alongside online entrepreneurs and help them do this thing because so many of them have a positive impact they want to make but and and they need the brand to help them get to where they want to go but the branding piece can be very challenging yeah and let's talk a little bit about the branding piece austin because i think for myself it's it's like it's like yeah i know what i want to put out there but i don't always know how i can translate that for people to understand and so do you feel like that might be the that might be the same way for your clientele where it's like maybe the reason why they're not good at it is because they don't know they they need the the help to see outside of themselves to to say hey this is how we can translate you you know to the public totally Mm -hmm. it is hard to see the nose attached to your face right it's a it's a part of you but Mm -hmm. you need actually need someone else to hold up a mirror and say this is one of the things that makes you distinctive let's put special emphasis on that so Mm -hmm. When we come alongside founders, come alongside online entrepreneurs, a lot of it is not sort of spinning up new things that didn't exist before. It's clearing away the clutter and helping them see the most important things, the most important attributes that have been there all along. Mm. And then like any building process, if you have a proven process, the results are better. You can hire an experienced general contractor to help you build a custom home. And you're typically going to get a much better result than if you tried to do it yourself and you had never built a home before. So we see there, um, we see four essential building blocks in a brand Mm -hmm. and each of those building blocks has four corners. So when you think about the 16 pieces that a brand needs, even if a founder or online entrepreneur has the, na- the natural capability or even the past experience that enables him or her to do half of those well, well, you still want to bring in an outside expert who is going to fall in love with your brand mm-hmm. and want to help the best and truest expression of your brand to show up in the world. Well, bring in the outside expert to come alongside you love it as much as you do, camaraderie for the journey. And then meanwhile, let's follow the proven process. Let's fill in all the gaps. Let's make your brand everything that it can be. And meanwhile, I'm very um, adamant about increasing founders' confidence in their own ability to operate the brand out in the real world. So our goal is to turn every client into a very gifted brand manager, because Mm. once you have it, you'll need to manage it over time. How do you make on-brand decisions? When we put together a brand strategy and brand guide, that is in part to say, here is your operating manual for your brand in the real world. Right. We're, we're not going to keep you weak so that you'll keep us around. We want to make you strong so that you're very confident in your own ability to do this moving forward, whether we're in the picture or not. So um, we like helping founders make their contributions to a better world and branding just happens to be one way we do that. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. Um, I, it kind of reminds me of how uh, in Aladdin, when Genie makes Aladdin into a sultan, and it's like, okay, you're a sultan now. Now you have to own it. You know, you have to run mm. with it. And obviously, you have the genie there. Um, you know, helping him 
stay or at least at least play the part. Now, we're not asking businesses to play a part or to act like there's something they're not, but that's sort right. of what it reminded me of is like, you know, you help bring the best out of people. You give them what they want others to perceive of them. And now they just have to own it. And they need people like you to help them see, help them maintain that and help them own that. Totally. And I think that's actually a really good example. I may have to steal that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'll, I'll give credit. I won't steal their <laughs> attribution, right? But the other thing I like about that example is we actually need a team. Mm -hmm. It takes a village to raise a brand, yes. right? And mm -hmm. unless you get the brand outside of the founder's head mm -hmm. and, and crystallize it and formalize it, in a way that other people can look at it, examine it and say, yes, I want to stand with you because of what you stand for. Unless you do that, it's really hard to grow. Mm -hmm. And so by formalizing the brand, by building a real brand outside of the founder, you can recruit team members who can support you and they come alongside you and they say, I wanna help you build this. Mm -hmm. because I'm as passionate about making that type of impact as you are. Also, your brand, once it's outside of you, that's how customers connect with you. You get super fans because they believe what you believe, because mm -hmm. your brand reinforces their aspirational identity, right? So right. that's why I'm so... Um, excited about putting more brands out there into the world. It's because brands can be leaders. And, yeah. but again, going back to founders, some of us get tripped up and we can't really find that cadence and really find that stride because we don't have enough help. Yeah. And then, you know, you're worried that your customer support lead or your marketing director or your COO, they're not going to make on brand decisions. Okay. We'll help them. And the mm -hmm. way you do that is by formalizing your brand. Yeah, no, that's absolutely powerful. Well, thank you so much for uh, really elaborating on that, Austin. I, I am curious to know uh, how you got to this place in your life, because I have in my notes here that you originally went to college to study to be an English teacher. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that and how you ended up being the brand guru you are today. Okay, so I will try to give you the very short version. <laughs> I taught high school English for a year. Mm -hmm. I found my first gray hair and I had that moment, that identity crisis where mm -hmm. I was like, is this what I want to do the rest of my life? Wow, and within, within the first year of you teaching. Within like the first three months, right? <laughs> I, was like, I was getting up early, I was always tired. I felt out of my depth all the time, found the gray hair took the GRE, started applying wow. to grad schools. But um, I thought that I wanted to be a college English profession, professor mm -hmm. and teach at the university level instead of high school level. Loved teaching, loved writing, loved reading. But a year into grad school, I thought, I don't, I don't want this life either. It's a wow. good life, but it's just not the one I want. Yeah. So ended up getting into marketing with a master's degree in creative writing and you know an MA in creative writing not the most natural sort of pivot mm -hmm. but um for a poet to get into business but loved it loved marketing loved branding mm. loved strategy was very confused had another identity crisis right because <laughs> i'm like wait i'm i thought like making money was bad like as oh as yeah a poet i'm supposed right. to be about like pure aesthetic expression or i'm not sure what that is but i'm supposed to be about it right anyway right, right um i the economy tanked in 2009 i started freelancing that set me on the path that i'm on now so for the last almost 12 years wow i have been helping business owners transform their businesses and create brands that they love and there have been some um, detours along the way or some other adventures, but the main thread has been helping people build brands, launch new ventures. That's fantastic. 
I, I want to touch a little bit on when you said that, you know, as a poet getting into business and studying marketing, you started to feel like, wait a minute, like, should I be doing this? Am I supposed to be doing this? Is this my, is this the most authentic way to be a poet, you know, mm. to be someone of talent or to have a talent in this way and then make it marketable. I know that there's a lot of entrepreneurs that struggle with that, especially new entrepreneurs. And so what did you have to tell yourself or what did you come to discover to get to a place where you're like, you know, art is a trade, you know, what mm. I'm doing, it's a trade. It's worth being paid. It, it's worth like, um, getting paid for. How did you get to that place? Cause I, like I said, I know that a lot of people, and even for myself, I'll struggle with that too. Mm. So I think uh, for a variety of reasons, we set up a false dichotomy between art and commerce mm -hmm. and you take who was it that painted the Sistine Chapel? Was it Da Vinci or Michelangelo? You're going to have to tell me. <laughs> oh gosh, I should have studied up on this. I think it was Da Vinci. No, it was, it was Michelangelo. One of the Italian Renaissance greats. How about that? <laughs> there you go. Was, was worried that the Pope at the time who commissioned him to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling was going to die before he got paid. Hmm. So needing to make a living doing something is just a reality of life. Right. And you're not sort of bastardizing or cheapening a gift that you have to create a certain kind of art if you simultaneously get paid by doing that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say that like my relationship with that art versus commerce um, dynamic. I didn't resolve that overnight, but mm. over time I realized I'm not entirely sure how this, this developed, but it's false. It's a mm. false dichotomy. You can be a true and authentic creator or artist or craftsperson and get paid, mm. right? Whether you want to call it the patronage model that existed in the Renaissance era where you have someone who's wealthy, who's like, Hey, paint this. It was very rarely just sort of open-ended creativity. Most of the time it was a commission and it wasn't paint this. It was paint my wife or mm. paint my husband mm -hmm. or do a statue of whoever, but I want the villain in the statue to be my foe, my enemy, right? Like mm -hmm. art was political. Sometimes art was propaganda. And mm. meanwhile, artists the whole time needed to get paid. And so when you look back across history, you're like, this idea that art is somehow pure and entirely separated from money is not real. It's mm. maybe even a relatively new thing. And once you get past that, yes, I think you can take on projects that give you more or less creative freedom. But the fact is all creative expression needs constraints. Mm. It needs boundaries. There right. are borders to the canvas. Uh, we could talk about that a long time because I'm <laughs> um, enthusiastic, let's say, about this topic in part because uh, I coach freelancers and consultants mm -hmm. and creatives and so many of us really grapple with this idea that we are somehow selling out mm -hmm. if we get paid to do something that we love. When you take a step back, you're like, but isn't that kind of beautiful to get paid to do work that doesn't feel like work? Isn't that better? Like, isn't that... Right you know, you're not more honest if you go get a construction job that you hate <laughs> and then paint on the nights and weekends. Right. How is that more authentic or more honest or more pure? So, okay, hopefully that my, I'm going to step down off my soapbox. Now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was very powerful, Austin. I, I like how you said, isn't it beautiful, you know, to get paid doing what you love, like doing what you actually enjoy. And that's really what everyone is trying to aspire to. And I wonder if, because it's culturally, you know, known to like work a job you hate, maybe that's part of, let's say the imposter syndrome when you do 
are, when you are doing something that you actually love, like you really like, like society doesn't always encourage that, you know? So I'm wondering if maybe that's partly where it comes from. I think so. I -hmm. think if you are doing something that you love and making money from it, there will always be critics who come out of the woodwork and try to make you feel less than try to make you feel like you've dragged your artistic integrity through the mud. Mm -hmm. And as with much criticism, maybe even most criticism, it's true source is jealousy and resentment. Um, Mm. I know that when I finished grad school, I would run into my colleagues and they would ask me what I was doing. And I'm like, Oh, I'm working at a marketing agency. I'm freelancing. And I was writing all the time. I had more time to work on my own writing projects after I got a full-time job than Mm. I had during grad school where I was spending the vast majority of my time teaching, grading papers, doing one-on-one writing conferences with students. So ironically, um, to try to bring my work, my creative work more in line with how I was making money gave me more time to do, again, I think this is not real, but the pure type of creative expression. And Mm. my, um, my colleagues made all sorts of jokes Mm -hmm. like, Oh, what is it like, um, using this poetry talent to write headlines or to write press releases or web content? How Mm -hmm. does that make you feel? And I'm like, great because (laughs) I'm making more money than you and I spend more time on my own writing than you. So how am I losing right now? There you go. Powerful. Austin, you are full of so much knowledge and wisdom. Uh, I want to thank you so much for taking time to chat with me today. I I do want to wrap up with just one more question. And I know you've already, like I said, you already dropped a lot of knowledge and advice and and really motivational talk for entrepreneurs. But is there one final thing you want to share? Maybe one more tip you want to share to our fellow uh, business owners and entrepreneurs that listen to The Thoughtful Entrepreneur? That is a really good question, Jen. The first thing that comes to mind is in this whole universe of brand building, if entrepreneurs in the thoughtful entrepreneur audience were to focus on just one thing, I would recommend clearly defining and articulating your brand purpose. Hmm. And I've got a worksheet that they're more than welcome to pick up. It's free, but this is the thing that will be your guiding light and your your true north. And for entrepreneurs who are going to have multiple ventures, perhaps, Mm. their their brand purpose will be deeply meaningful to them as individuals. And different ventures may simply be different expressions Mm -hmm. of that core brand purpose. And in fact, that brand purpose is what help what can help you decide where to take your brand next. I love participating in other people's transformation. And so whether I do that with writing or with speaking and conversations like this, whether I do it with putting publishing a children's book or even um, being the dad who's around so much that my kids want me to go away. (laughs) A big part of my brand purpose is I want to participate in other people's transformation and help them make their contributions Mm. because that's how I scale up my own positive impact. And because I've gotten clear on what my brand purpose is, both for Austin L Church at austinlchurch.com and also for our team at Balernum, I tell you what, it really simplifies decision making. And Mm -hmm. you can get a lot of other things with your brand wrong. And if you get your brand purpose right and you keep following that, Mm -hmm. I believe you will eventually get where you need to go. That's powerful. Awesome. Well, uh, Austin, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Um, if you can, just really, really quickly, I know that we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you this because you were saying that this goes against all your branding <laughs> rules. <laughs> what does Balernum stand for? And why did you choose that as your company name? Balernum stands for hope. 
Beautiful. And I chose that name because our first choice, which was, wait for it, pineapple, was <laughs> going to potentially be contentious from a legal point of view because there were already some trademark applications pending. Wow. But Balernum, and this is a story for another time, it came to me in a dream. Wow. And so when pineapple was off the table and I was like, okay, um, my co-founder was like, what's going to happen? You know, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. This name popped up in my head again. And I was like, surely right. not bad. It's too obscure. It's difficult to pronounce, hard to spell, hard to remember. I joked with you earlier that most of our clients uh, misspell it on like checks and <laughs> But it was so deeply meaningful to me that I'm like, I'm going to break all my own rules. I'm going to yeah. go for this. Yeah. So. Maybe, maybe that's the exceptional rule. If you saw it in a dream. Yeah. That, that's the ultimate Trump card. Sorry. <laughs> you know, it's but. like, sorry, I was in my dream. It had to be there. It had to be there. That's right. Well, awesome. Uh, Austin, thank you again so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Jen. I loved our conversation. Yes. And uh, if our listeners want to learn more about Austin Church and Balernum, you can visit his website. That's B-A-L-E-R-N-U-M.com, Balernum.com. All right. With that said, thank you all so much for joining us. And we look forward to chatting with you in the next episode. Bye.